President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Ilham Aliyev. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to all our guests for participation at the fourth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. Six years ago, we launched this initiative and the first forum was organized in Baku. Since that time, forum transformed into a global international event addressing one of the most important issues on the world agenda, intercultural dialogue. Every international event, every forum, its importance is judged not only by the topics of discussions, but also by the list of participants. We are very happy that more than 800 guests representing more than 120 countries participate today at the forum and also almost 50 international delegations send their high representatives to Baku. This, uh, first of all, demonstrates uh, the importance of the forum and at the same time the importance of the discussions which we will have today and tomorrow. We are proud that the number of partners of the forum, organizations which are organizers of the forum is also growing. Government of Azerbaijan is organizing this forum in partnership with UNESCO, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, ISESCO, Council of Europe, World Tourism Organizations, and Food and Agriculture Organization. I am sure that the discussions and exchange of views during the forum will contribute to promotion of intercultural dialogue. Azerbaijan for centuries was a place where civilizations and cultures meet. Our geography, our history and development in Azerbaijan demonstrate that intercultural dialogue is one of the most important issues in the history and also today. Because without that, the world will be much more in danger. Our history, our traditions, our geography actually dictated that Azerbaijan could be and should be an area where civilizations meet. And for centuries, uh, people who inhabited Azerbaijan always lived in a diverse environment. Multiculturalism, ethnic and religious diversity is our history and is today's reality. And we are proud of that. Today Azerbaijan is a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional country where representatives of all the ethnic groups and religions live in peace and harmony. Our historical monuments also clearly demonstrate the cultural diversity of Azerbaijan and its ancient history. We are proud that one of the oldest mosques in the world, which was built in 743, is situated in one of the ancient cities of Azerbaijan, Shamahi. One of the oldest churches, Church of Ancient State, Caucasian Albania is also situated in Azerbaijan, is another, in another ancient city of Shiki. In Baku, uh, the fire temple, which belongs to religion of Zoroastrism, also demonstrates our cultural and religious diversity. Today, mosques, churches, synagogues, which exist in Azerbaijan are, are protected by our state and many of them were built with the state financing 
demonstrate our history and also demonstrate our policy. Multiculturalism is a state policy in Azerbaijan and at the same time it's uh, our lifestyle. Though the word multicultural, multiculturalism is relatively new and sometimes very difficult to pronounce, but the ideas of multiculturalism always existed in our country. Regardless the time of history, regardless the political system in Azerbaijan, our people always were active defenders and promoters of in multiculturalism inside Azerbaijan and beyond our borders. And actually the decision to organize first time in 2011 the forum which will address uh, intercultural dialogue was motivated by our history, by our reality and also by our uh, <clears throat> wish to create a broad format to address these issues. Today we need to do it maybe more than ever before because unfortunately now some concerning tendencies in the world lead sometimes not to cultural, intercultural dialogue but to alienation. We see it regularly that in different parts of the world the conflicts uh, confrontations, civil wars are uh, generated by lack of understanding between representatives of different religions, different ethnic groups. Our policy of multiculturalism is fully supported by our people and uh, 2016 was announced the year of multiculturalism in Azerbaijan. This year is announced the year of Islamic solidarity. And the combination of these two very important elements of Azerbaijan's day-to-day -day life, uh, first of all, demonstrates the status of our society, our state policy, and also leads to more understanding in the region. We uh, held several important international events addressing particularly this issue. Uh, five times already Azerbaijan organized international humanitarian forum. We organized several years ago the World Religious Leaders Summit. Last year the seventh global forum of alliance of civilizations was very successfully held in Baku and of course for the first time we gather to address the issues of intercultural dialogue. So all this helps us to find the ways how to reduce tensions, how to reduce risks, how to create better understanding between peoples and religions. And I think that the history of Azerbaijan and its today's development is a good example that it is possible to achieve success. There are different views about multiculturalism we sometimes hear from different public figures, politicians, leaders of the country, different skeptical views about that. I think that if we unite our efforts, and today representatives of absolute majority of the international community are here, we can demonstrate and prove uh, that multiculturalism is alive, and there is no alternative to that. Alternative is xenophobia, alternative is Islamophobia, is anti-Semitism, is racism, is discrimination. Uh, multiculturalism is not only a <coughs> trend, it is the only way how to make the world safer. And I think that uh, your presence at this forum and the topics of discussions clearly demonstrate our common will and uh, our policy and our approach to promote these values. In 2008, Azerbaijan initiated a very important process which later was called Baku process and which is now highly appreciated by the international community. 
that initiative also was generated by these factors which I already described and also the fact that Azerbaijan is one of the very few countries which is member of Islamic Cooperation Organization and Council of Europe at the same time. And uh, in 2008, when we organized the ministerial meeting of ministers of member states of the Council of Europe, we invited ministers from countries of Islamic Cooperation Organization. So that was the first time when such a big gathering of representatives of more than 100 countries came together to address important issues of intercultural relations. In 2009, Azerbaijan, as a member of Islamic Cooperation Organization, was hosting uh, the meeting of the ministers and invited the ministers from Council of Europe countries. Uh, this initiative and this format later was called uh, Baku process. We are proud of that. First of all, because it was our initiative. Second, because I think Baku, Azerbaijan, deserves to be the center of intercultural dialogue. And uh, next year, we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of Baku process. And the uh, government of Azerbaijan and United Nations Alliance of Civilizations launched an initiative to create an award, Baku Process Award, for leadership in intercultural dialogue, which will be presented to those who play a very active role in promotion of dialogue of cultures and dialogue of civilizations. Another important initiative launched by Azerbaijan was to organize European Games in Baku. Uh, unlike other continental games, European Games were never held before. And uh, when the European Olympic Committee decided to organize these games, there were not many bidders. And frankly speaking, Azerbaijan was the only country which uh, made the proposal to organize these games in Baku. Probably, if not for that, these games would have never been organized. And 2015 was a year of first inaugural European Games held in Baku with participation of more than 5,000 European athletes. Uh, these games were, of course, a sporting event. At the same time, uh, I think it was a symbolic that the first European Games were organized in a Muslim country. That was a demonstration of multiculturalism. That was a demonstration of religious tolerance. And uh, the games were organized on a high level, and the athletes, guests, were very satisfied and happy with organization and also with the reception from the people of Azerbaijan who showed their traditional hospitality to our European guests. This year, just in one week's time, we will uh, start fourth Islamic Solidarity Games with participation of all the Muslim countries and more than 3,000 athletes. So in two years' time, in one city, European Games and Islamic Games, this is demonstration of our policy and uh, our intentions. And again, it's not only a sporting event, though of course, I'm sure there'll be very strong competition. It's an event which unites people. We need unity, first of all, in the Muslim world. Unfortunately, it's the Muslim countries which suffer most of all from terrorism. And uh, Azerbaijan plays a very important role in uh, promotion of the Islamic values. We organize different international events in European capitals, presentations, exhibitions, to demonstrate the ancient Islamic culture. And we are one of the most active countries to fight against uh, Islamophobia and uh, attempts to connect Islam with terror. So we need unity in the Muslim world in order to make our region safer. And at the same time, we need active communication between Islamic Cooperation Organization, Council of Europe, other international organizations to reduce tensions. 
Therefore, when we are talking about intercultural dialogue, we clearly understand that the impact of the success of this dialogue can be seen in every area, in political life, in the areas related to security, in economic cooperation. Because without predictable partnership and uh, relations based on mutual respect, today it will be very difficult to achieve the goals every country puts in front of itself. Therefore, uh, these initiatives and already, I think, the success story of Azerbaijan as one of the international centers of multiculturalism, and by the way, we created the International Center of Multiculturalism, demonstrates that we are not only on the right track, but we are moving successfully. And today's forum, which uh, <coughs> embraces the whole world, is a clear demonstration of our intentions. Azerbaijan is a relatively young independent country, though the country with a great history, traditions, and culture. But as an independent country, we're only 25 years old. Last year, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of restoration of our independence. And uh, these years clearly demonstrate that when the tail of your country is in your hands, you can achieve great success. Azerbaijan for centuries was part of different countries, empires. And uh, today's 25 years of independence clearly demonstrates that only being free we can achieve success. Never in the history of our nation, Azerbaijan was as strong as it is today. We made significant achievements in uh, social, economic, political life. Uh, today, Azerbaijan is a rapidly developing, dynamic, modern country, which is very <coughs> close to its roots, traditional roots, but at the same time open to the world, modern. Uh, the biggest problem we are facing is the Armenian occupation. Unfortunately, our restoration of independence was accompanied by Armenian aggression, which resulted in occupation of 20% uh, of our internationally recognized territory, Nagorno-Karabakh and seven other districts which are uh, occupied by Armenia. As a result of this occupation, more than one million Azerbaijanis became refugees and internally displaced persons. Our people were subject of ethnic cleansing. And today on the occupied territories, all our historical monuments, uh, buildings demolished by Armenia. Our mosques are destroyed. Here in the center of Baku, we renovated the Armenian church, but uh, Armenia on the occupied territories demolished all our uh, historical and religious heritage, and the pictures of that can be obtained through internet. And at the same time, OEC sent two times fact-finding mission to the occupied territories, and in this report clearly reflected the devastation of the occupied territories. United Nations Security Council, the highest international body, four times adopted resolutions, four resolutions, which demand immediate and unconditional withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories. For more than 20 years, these resolutions are not implemented. Armenia ignores them and violates brutally international law and decisions of Security Council, and there is no mechanism to force aggressor to comply with the resolutions. And this is a very important issue, which is of big concern to our people, that sometimes decisions of Security Council of the United Nations are implemented within days, if not hours. But in our case, it's more than 20 years. This is a demonstration of double standards, first of all, and this is also a demonstration of, uh, to a certain degree, an efficiency of uh, mechanisms of implementation of resolutions. The conflict must be based, the resolution of the conflict, on international law norms, United Nations Charter, Helsinki Final Act, and territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. The whole world recognizes territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, and Nagorno-Karabakh is a historical and legal part of our country. 
Despite this uh, tragedy and the very heavy economic burden, because we have a million refugees, <coughs> especially in the beginning of the 90s when we were very poor, was a serious economic problem and social problem for us, we managed to mobilize our efforts and to build a strong country. Today, Azerbaijan is a politically, economically stable country. Azerbaijan is a very respected member of international community, and I can name many uh, <coughs> facts to demonstrate it. Only one, I think, will be enough. Several years ago, 155 countries uh, voted for Azerbaijan to be elected as a non-permanent member of United Nations Security Council. So this support of absolute majority of countries of the world demonstrates that Azerbaijan has a very good international reputation. We are very active member of Islamic Cooperation Organization. At the same time, with nine members of countries of European Union, Azerbaijan signed or adopted uh, documents on strategic partnership. Uh, this is a role we are playing in the region and we managed to transform our geographical location into important infrastructure facilities. Today, transportation projects which we initiated connecting by railroad the Asia with Europe uh, generate already a lot of profit, at the same time create a very important links between countries. At the same time, Azerbaijan is the initiator of the huge energy projects. One of them, which is being implemented now, is the biggest infrastructure project in Europe, worth 40 billion US dollars of investments. Southern Gas Corridor will connect seven countries at the first stage and uh, will provide energy diversification and energy security for many countries of our region, of uh, Central Europe and uh, Southern Europe. So this is a project of energy security, energy diversification and cooperation because all the countries involved in our energy and transportation projects will become a natural partners, will be mutually or interdependent. And interdependency is one of the important factors for economic cooperation and for mutual respect. So transportation and energy projects which were initiated by Azerbaijan, of course, serve the course of uh, development and prosperity. At the same time, it's our investments in international cooperation and intercultural dialogue. Our economic performance also was very impressive. For the last 13 years, our economy GDP grew more than three times. We managed to reduce unemployment down to 5%, poverty a little less than 6%. We have a very low level of foreign debt, only 20% of our GDP, and our reserves are five times bigger than our foreign debt. So it's a really very impressive economic performance, which is, uh, by the way, highly appreciated by international institutions. Davos World Economic Forum ranks Azerbaijan economy with respect to competitiveness uh, number 37. And uh, another assessment of Davos Economic Forum with respect to development of developing countries. In this list, Azerbaijan is sharing the first and second place. Uh, all this is a big asset which was created in the years of independence. We invest largely in education. Today, the level of literacy in Azerbaijan is close to 100%. More than 3,000 schools were built in our country during the last decade. Investments in education, as we all know very well, it's investment in the future. At the same time, it's uh, uh, investment in stability and security because radicalism, extremism, fundamentalism is generated mainly by illiteracy, lack of education, when young generation is brainwashed and uh, 
is directed to commit terrible acts of terror. Uh, illiteracy, poverty, social inequality, and justice, these are the main sources of uh, radicalism. Therefore, in order to rad eradicate radicalism, we need to address these fundamental reasons which generate it. At the same time, we need to promote the values of interculturalism so that people clearly see the benefits of peaceful coexistence, of living side by side. And here we also come to a very important issue of responsibility. Responsibility of politicians, which in order sometimes to gain more votes from the radicals, are uh, changing their program to be more nationalistic. Responsibility of non-governmental organizations, some of them which uh, deliberately provoke uh, tensions based on religious and ethnic roots, and responsibility of media, because what we mainly see on international media is migrant crisis, wars, devastations, clashes, religious uh, and ethnic conflicts. And, uh, but there are a lot of positive examples, and we need also to de demonstrate them. I think one of the goals and importance of this forum is that we are addressing this issue, we are uh, uniting our efforts, all the delegates and participants of the forum, I'm sure, came here with one agenda, how to strengthen and promote the values of intercultural dialogue, and um, I'm sure that results of the forum will uh, be successful and uh, we will implement all the decisions of the forum. And I once again like to thank you for being with us and wish the forum success. Thank you. The floor is given to Ms. Irina, the General of UNESCO. His Excellency Mr. Ilham Aliyev, President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, His Excellency Mr. Bobakar Keita, President of the Republic of Mali, uh, Her Excellency Vice President of Bulgaria, Ilyana Yotova, leaders, ministers, religious leaders, ambassadors, dear friends. I'm deeply honored to participate in this fourth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. And I vividly recalled listening to His Excellency President Aliyev of my participation in the previous very successful similar forum. And of course, my first gratitude goes to His Excellency President Ilham Aliyev for his long-standing leadership in promoting intercultural dialogue, so much needed today. This embodies also in the tireless engagement of the First Lady Mrs. Mehriban Alieva, as UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Oral and Musical Traditions. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that this reflects Azerbaijan's long history, history of tradition, history of culture, of intercultural dialogue, of interreligious inter exchange, on the Silk Road as a center for scholarship, art, philosophy, and knowledge. We see this embodied in Baku's walled city, inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List, and Azerbaijan's rich in tangible cultural heritage, including the ancient art of carpet weaving and the celebration of Novruz, jointly inscribed on the UNESCO representative list. We need this leadership more than ever today. Across the world, we see conflicts tearing countries apart with civilians hit hardest. We see the rise of violent extremism and cultural cleansing 
We see mosques, churches, and other temples destroyed, and cultural diversity threatened. We see education under attack, and children forced out of learning. We see freedom of expression threatened, journalists attacked. We see societies closing against perceived others, minorities persecuted. We see the rise of Asian hatreds, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racial discrimination, intolerance. In this context, as so convincingly just said by President Aliyev, we have no choice. We must remain true to the compass setting of human rights and dignity, and we must respond. Hard power today, ladies and gentlemen, is not enough. We need the soft power, the soft power of education, of knowledge, of culture, communication, the sciences, to strengthen the values we share and recognize the destiny we hold in common. All cultures are different, but humanity is a single family, bound by respect for dignity and rights for all. This is our vision of the world. This is UNESCO's vision. We are rebuilding mosques and mausoleums in Timbuktu, Mr. President Keita. This is our vision. We are defending humanity's shared heritage as our commonwealth. This is also our vision. We are promoting new forms of global solidarity, of global citizenship. This is also our vision. For us, for UNESCO, Peace must be founded upon the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind, as is inscribed in our Constitution. Today, tolerance is not enough. Passive coexistence is insufficient. We need solidarity. We need understanding. We need respect for diversity as a source of confidence and belonging a wellspring for creativity and innovation. We need sharing. We need acceptance of the difference of the other. And you, Mr. President Aliyev, so convincingly just said, diversity is our everyday reality. We need new policies based on rights and democracy to make the most of its power for all. These goals guide all of our UNESCO's activities, and that is why we are so proud to be here with our partners, with intergovernmental organizations, with the Alliance of Civilization, with the CESCO, with so many other partners that are here, and we, the United Nations system, I'm mentioning the Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Tourist Organization, and the wide range of non-governmental organizations and private sector actors. These goals underpin the international standards UNESCO is upholding for the safeguarding and promoting of cultural heritage and cultural diversity. They guide our leadership of the international decade for the rapprochement of cultures until the year 2022 to promote interreligious and intercultural dialogue, understanding and cooperation for peace. And this is why we are so proud that we, a few months ago, finalized a tremendous work done by more than 100 scholars to publish the first ever history of Islam with the six volumes on Islam and philosophy, Islam and sciences, Islam and culture, the foundation of Islam. And this is also our response for interreligious and intercultural dialogue. And the, these actions inspire our work to prevent violent extremism through global citizenship education, through resources to support teachers in promoting peace in classrooms, through support to the internet as a force for dialogue and human rights, to prevent the radicalization of young women and men to bolster media literacy. This is our work also to teach and educate in Holocaust and to prevent future genocides in the world. And I believe this echoes the determination of the Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez to lead what he called 
a surge in the diplomacy of peace. In his words, and I quote the Secretary General, we need a global response that addresses the root causes of conflict and integrates peace, sustainable development and human rights in a holistic way from conception to execution. Mesdames et Messieurs, la construction... Ladies and gentlemen, construction of peace needs necessarily a new effort, a renewed effort for education, knowledge, uh, and intercultural dialogue. This is at the very heart of the mandate of UNESCO, and this is why we're trying to strengthen the capabilities of educators in many countries, Albania, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kyrgyzstan, many other countries, as well as in Uzbekistan. Uh, we are working hands in hands in uh, Western Africa with the International Organization for Francophonie. We support education for the prevention of violent extremism in Europe, in Morocco, in Mauritania, in Senegal, and elsewhere. This is one of the reasons I had initially said, and is one of the reasons why UNESCO is working worldwide in favor of education. We need to teach the, our history so that we never forget in order to fight today uh, racism, hatred, and also to prevent any other new genocide. Protecting culture, ladies and gentlemen, it goes beyond the preservation of stone and buildings. Pre protecting culture is all about talking about what you use, uh, is uh, taking care of identities, uh, and uh, inventing and discovering differences. This is uh, what is most uh, closest uh, uh, for the population. So we have to strengthen dialogue and peace and understanding. This is the message which comes out of the, uh, the Security Council's historic message that was adopted on the 24th of March on the protection of the cultural heritage in case of conflict. I also believe that this is the message of the, of the Baku process. Cultural diversity is not a threat, it is a chance for all. Uh, I would also go further and say that it is also the source of, uh, uh, of pride. It is the very spirit of humanism which is based uh, on this uh, uh, century-old uh, poet, uh, poet, uh, poet uh, from Azerbaijan, Katedi, uh, whose uh, uh, anniversary was celebrated by UNESCO in 2013. And I would like to mention the poet. When I went beyond, the road opened to me. That road that opened to me is there in front of us, ladies and gentlemen, and leads uh, others to dialogue, which is the very essence of our uh, common research in favor of peace. And I thank you, and I wish you every success uh, in your forum. The floor is not the Kalima, the Sayed Nasr Abdaziz Nasr, Mumathil Umam Mutahida, the Tahal for the Havarat. Your Excellency, Ashaba Saad. صاحب السعادة الرئيس اللي رئيس جمهورية أزربيجان أصحاب السعادة والمعالي والقادة الدينيين السيدات والسادة إنه لمن دواعي السرور أن أقدم إلى باكو ثانية لقد مرت سنة منذ إذا استقبلت مدينتكم المنتدى السابع للتحالف وإن نجاح الكبير لهذا المنتدى سيكون إرثا تتقاسمه كل المنظمات الدولية وحكومتكم وأنا سعيد جدا بأن فريقنا يعمل معا ثانية كشركاء في تنظيم المنتدى الدولي للحوار بين الثقافات إن مسار باكو أصبح منصة حقيقية 
تمكن كل شعوب العالم لدعم الحوار بين الثقافات وأيضا السلام والاندماج الاجتماعي بالنسبة للسنة الثانية فإن تحالف الحضارات قرر دعم المبادرة منذ بدايتها كقاعدة تمكن وتشجع الشعوب وكل سكان العالم لاتخاذ أعمال لفائدة التنوع والحوار والتفاهم المتبادل إن التركيز هذه السنة على ذو أهمية قصوى إن الأمن الإنساني يجعل الإنسان في مركز الاهتمام وبما في ذلك التنمية والحقوق الإنسان والسلام والأمن والتنمية المستدامة وحقوق الإنسان يتم التركيز عليها وتقويتها عندما نحاول أن ننفذ ذلك fragmentation as a major weakness. The Charter of the United Nations, which we are all here to uphold, has been fundamental in linkage those three pillars. Peace must be our goal and our guide. When the first took office, Secretary General Mr. Antonio Guterres launched an appeal for peace with the hope that every Everyone strive to overcome differences. Peace takes constant effort, and we must all work together within our respective mandates, means, and responsibilities to achieve it. We must collectively draw strength from the spirit of the UN Charter to better prevent armed conflicts and sustain peace through intercultural dialogue. Social inclusion and development, and this means ensuring the effective protection of all human rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. The current global challenges to peace and harmonious coexistence among people of different religious and cultural backgrounds require urgent attention and action. We must promote intercultural dialogue as a tool to prevent conflict and to mediation as process for reconciliation that will allow us to reaffirm the universal values of understanding, tolerance, and respect for diversity. The main objective of the Baku process and the WFID is to promote sustainable dialogue and peace in the world as it emphasized the human security approach. It will strengthen community resilience and enable dialogue across diverse communities. Let me recall that in December 2012, the United Nations General Assembly endorsed the UNESCO proposal declaring the period of 2013 to 2022 as the international decade for the rapprochement of cultures and adopt resolution A slash 67 slash L 104 on the promotion of interreligious inter and intercultural dialogue, understanding and cooperation for peace. Moreover, the United Nations reiterate its support for the, for the interreligious and intercultural dialogue as mean to prevent violent extremism and tackle the causes of radicalization at its roots. Through the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy and the BFV Plan of Action, the United Nations not only acknowledged the, inter, the intertwining of peace, security, and sustainable development, but also recognized the importance of education and intercultural dialogue to prevent tensions, violence, and extremism. In this vein, 
the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations works closely with the relevant UN agencies and divisions mandated with the implementation of this plan of action. I am honored to be one of the members of the high-level VE action group appointed by the UN Secretary General. The instrument I mentioned earlier also enshrined the role of various actors in the preventing of conflicts and the promotion of peace, including civil society and the business community, with a particular focus on women, youth, and religious leaders. Therefore, this year, the fourth forum iteration integrated in new dimensions, including the first high-level meeting of international organizations with strong partners such as DVD, CIDA, USAID, ASEAN, the Bretton Woods Institute, the business sector, and of course, UNESCO and ICESCO, to name but a few. In this fourth forum, we welcome you as our global connectors. The, the, w, the WFID will serve as a platform for more member states, religious leaders, civil society, public and private institutions, and other stakeholders to counter the ideological struggle led on the ground by violent extremist groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram. In order to fight this scourge, advance intercultural dialogue and achieve peace, it is our duty to strengthen partnership with all these actors through diverse cultural approaches that promote social cohesion, inclusivity, resilience, creativity, skills, and knowledge. Let's not forget the importance of religious understanding. In the midst of today's challenges, fundamentalist groups are misusing religion to, main, to manipulate vulnerable people and spread terror why religious minority as well as multiple cultural and ethnic groups are being violently targeted due to their religion or belief. Millions of men and women and children fleeing war and conflict are being excluded. We must together to award implementing human security and achieving peace, peace and development. This not only entails expanding our action and capabilities, but also understanding and human solidarity. At the turn of the 21 century, we invested great hope in creating inclusive societies in which all men and women would be united through indivisible and universal values of human dignity, freedom, equality, and solidarity, but also human rights ensuring equal access to opportunities, respect for diversity, tolerance, and understanding. The United Nations hence launched the Millennium Development Goals in year 2000 with full support of civil society. The community was, the commitment was renewed 15 years later with 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. Let's make sure that we achieve these new goals together. Let's capitalize on our achievements by reinforcing cultural bridges and building on our cultural and religious communities. More than ever today, we all understand that the 2030 agenda must include all people, especially youth and women, embracing cultural and religious diversity. No one must be left behind. It, all, it is crucial to remember that human progress will only be secured through better integration between people, society, religion, and culture. In this regard, political leadership plays an important role, particularly at this critical time, where some political leaders use xenophobia, rhetoric, and people 
fears to divide societies and advance their own political objective. I urge on political leaders to avoid hate speech that ultimately contribute to that place and to the hands of those extremists who seek to undermine our values and the fabric of our society. At the UNAOC, we are highly aware of the issue at stake and, and counter and continue our efforts towards promoting a cross-cultural and religious dialogue and building bridges in close partnership with civil society organization in pre pursuing these objectives we have found in Azerbaijan a vital partner. This initiative will certainly strengthen further multi-level cooperation and will, I sincerely hope, serve intercultural dialogue, mediation, and reconciliation to prevent critical situation worldwide. In closing, let us reflect on those words. The world can never be at peace unless people have security in their daily lives. I look forward to exchange creative ideas and initiatives with you during this forum, and I wish you all the success. Thank you. The floor is given to Mr. Taleb Rifai, the Secretary General of the World Tourism Organization. Mr. President, what a pleasure and an honor to be with you again. Every time I'm here in Baku, every time I have the honor and the opportunity of meeting you, I'm renewed with hope and optimism. Listening to you this morning has reinforced that in our minds. Your presence here carries a great, great message. We understand it, we respect it, and we value it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. President Bubakar Kita, you come from a great country and you're here to give the support to a wonderful cause. We thank you for joining us. <laughs> Madam Vice President, it's an honor and a pleasure to finally meet with you and be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all your good efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could recognize you all one by one. I see in this room many, many good friends, many wonderful people that have contributed so much to making this world a better place. But you can understand the limitation of time. So thank you so much for being here. My dear friends, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today in this beautiful Baku morning. Baku is a wonderful city. While flying last night only three hours ago over the city of Baku, I was always reminded how every time I'm here, I'm overwhelmed and surprised with how much has happened in this city. Every time I come, there's a new scene. I was here only one year ago, and still, I was overwhelmed to wake up this morning from the balcony of my room in the hotel to see the new fresh energy of Baku. My dear friends, Mr. President, Albert Einstein once said, the distinction between the past present and future, is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. For though we acknowledge the past, we cannot change it. And though we cannot predict the future, we can manage, help shape the future we want. Let's always keep that in mind. As global leaders, we are entrusted with the task and will continue to be and to try to steer the ship the best possible way into what is becoming a rather unknown future and navigate through uncertain times and difficult times. Because indeed, we're living times of confusion and uncertainty. Another great thinker and writer, Charles Dickens, once said, 
We live in the worst of times, we live in the best of times. We live in times of natural disasters and health pandemics, times of economic crisis, times of terror threats and wars, times of increasing assaults on human rights, times of persistent inequality, times of menace of the climate change, but also times of isolationism, travel bans and building walls. But despite these complex and interlinked challenges, despite the acts against freedom of movement and travel, the sector that I very proudly represent, I want to challenge all of this and suggest that we are indeed living in the best of times. We're living in a beautiful world, my dear friends. As a global community, we're indeed living better world from the world we came from. I come from a generation that still remembers that, and I'm sure many of you here in this room would share this feeling. We're today more connected, more informed, more involved. We therefore know more and care more about each other. We're more compassionate and more understanding. When an earthquake happens in Japan, or a tsunami happens in Japan, it happens in my backyard. When girls are kidnapped in Nigeria, they're my girls, they're your girls. We know more, we care more, we indeed live in a better world. And it's in this new world that I would like to believe as a representative of a sector within the UN system that is entrusted with travel and tourism, that the transformative power of travel is a cornerstone in this new world. Because, Mr. President and my dear friends, only last year there was 1,235 million international tourists that crossed borders in one single year. That is almost one out of six of the people of the world making an international trip every year. In doing so, we have tremendous benefits to communities, economies, and societies. One out of 10 of the jobs of the world are generated by this human activity called travel, 10% of world GDP. We have become the third largest industry in the world after chemicals and fuels. By the year 2030, the travelers of the world will be crossing borders in one single year at the number of 1.8 billion international travelers. I'm therefore very sure that in 40, 50, 60 years from now, the future generations would look back at this time and say, that was the age of travel. But with growth comes power, with power comes responsibility. We can end up with 1.8 billion opportunities or 1.8 billion disasters. It's all up to us. What we need to do is we need to make this 1.8 billion travelers opportunities for inclusive economic growth, opportunities for better jobs, decent jobs, opportunities to protect our natural and cultural heritage, opportunities to better know and respect each other, and in the process, build a better world. Our Secretary General Antonio Guterres was quoted many times by many of the speakers before, and I would like to quote him on something connected to us, because he said, and I quote, beyond the measurable advantages of travel and what it can make possible, it is a bridge to better mutual understanding among people from all walks of life, unquote. Travel, Mr. President, my dear friends, open minds, open eyes and open hearts. We become better people when we travel. I have traveled the world. I am a better person. Each one of you becomes a better person when they travel. My dear friends, the world may be suffering from so many deficits, educational deficit, economic deficit, technological deficit, but the one most critical and most important deficit of them all is the deficit of tolerance and understanding. And there is nothing more powerful than people meeting each other, rubbing shoulders, to break down stereotypes and fight bigotry and build bridges of understanding and compassion. Building a better world does not mean building walls or banning people from traveling. I know that I'm touching on very sensitive issues, but not only because this increases tension and therefore increases security risks itself as a result, but also because ultimately we are bending and serving the agenda of these forces of darkness. They want us to stop traveling. They want us to separate, be separated from each other by mistrust, hate each other. This is their agenda. 
not our agenda. Building a better world, however, means cooperating and addressing global challenges without compromising people's rights to move around and exercise their very basic human right. Travel today, my friends, have become a human right. My right to relax, my right to enjoy the world, my right to see other people, my right to educate yourself, uh, myself, my right to do business. This is our agenda. Mr. President, in the year 2015, the United Nations General Assembly accomplished three very important mark milestones. <clears throat> One, it approved the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. 193 member states, governments, approved the roadmap for 2030. But two, in December of 2015, we all signed the Paris Agreement, which was a very important milestone. And three, I'd like to also share with you that in September of 2015, this year, 2017, was declared and designated as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development and Peace. 2017, therefore, is a very special year for us and a unique opportunity for all of us to come together to promote the contribution that we can do to the better world. And as a grand 21st century human activity to a better future for people and planet. Today in our globalized world, interconnected world, strengthening global partnership is very crucial. Global challenges can only be addressed through global partnership. There is no other way. Platforms such as the World Forum for Intercultural Dialogue, the one we are in today, are ideal opportunities to strengthen partnership and commitment. My dear friends, one last thought, as this definitely may be my last official visit here to your beautiful country, Mr. President, as Secretary General of UNWTO. We travel to places that we respect. Respect the people, respect the society, respect the culture, respect the nature. Because in doing so, we gain our self-respect. Self we don't go to places that we don't feel good. That is why, Mr. President, people will continue to travel and to come to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, a land that has so much respect in the eyes of so many people. You call it the land of fire. Fire embodies energy. And you could see it all over the room. You could see it all over this place. You have led a wonderful nation. You're a lucky president, Mr. President, presiding over wonderful people. My dear friends, let's always remember that whatever our business in life is, whatever our business in life is, and I'm sure you're all leading very important businesses and careers in life, let's always remember that our core business, our core business in life, is simply to make this world a better place. Thank you very much. Tashakkurlar. The floor is given to Mr. Yusuf bin Ahmed Al Putaimi, the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. the spirit of multiculturalism, I, please allow me to deliver my speech in Arabic. In the name of Allah, most merciful, Excellency President Alam Aliyev, Excellency President of Mali, ladies and gentlemen, peace be upon you. First of all, I would like uh, to express uh, my pleasure to be here for the first time in this beautiful uh, city of Baku after becoming the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. I'm honored uh, to take part in this uh, important event. It is uh, my pleasure to warmly thank His Excellency President uh, Alam Aliyev and the government of his country 
for extending this invitation to us. We are grateful for the warm welcome we have had. I would like to say that our participation in this uh, forum uh, under the Baku process launched in 2011 to enhance uh, the dialogue between uh, cultures in this world is uh, rooted in our belief that serious dialogue is the gateway to strong relationships between countries, civilizations, and cultures. Excellency President, you have devoted considerable efforts which have led to the establishment of this space where countries and civilizations meet in this regard. I would like to uh, thank UNESCO and uh, the UN Alliance for Civilization and the World Tourism Organization, the FAO, ISESCO, the uh, Ministry of Culture in Azerbaijan for all the efforts they have uh, devoted to the organization of this event. Uh, the folks is on enhancing the dialogue between culture towards sustainable development and uh, peace. This is what you have chosen to focus on. This simply leads me to say that culture is paramount to sustainable development, which is also uh, rooted in our understanding of the security issues in its uh, various uh, dimensions, uh, including uh, social diversity and not just uh, security related aspects. This uh, cultural diversity is uh, reflected in the diversity of ideas, beliefs, languages, uh, religions, uh, uh, social ties, uh, customs, uh, art, and all other expressions of uh, art. So. This is a cornerstone to attain the goals of development. The organization of this session is an important milestone to face the challenges that the humanity encounters. There is a lot of tension between people and religions, which has led to wars. Uh, extremism and conflict. Uh, the organization of Islamic Corporation has always adopted a dialogue uh, as a way to um, uh, enhance this dialogue between culture and to enhance cultural peace and peaceful uh, uh, co-living. And we are uh, working towards uh, uh, new ways to strengthen uh, the dialogue between civilization based on the acceptance of others and mutual uh, respect. Our folks today uh, should also be on raising awareness to uh, uh, the uh, rising Islamophobia through uh, disseminating the principles of uh, peace and understanding between cultures and peoples. Uh, the uh, Istanbul uh, process launched by uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation um, um, as part of its contribution uh, uh, to uh, the 1618 resolution of the UN Council for Human Rights is a major uh, step uh, towards uh, facing uh, the uh, culture of uh, hatred and discrimination through uh, enshrining a culture of uh, respect, mutual understanding uh, between uh, peoples and civilization. Finally, I would like uh, to uh, stress again our commitment to uh, support uh, um, innovating ideas uh, that uh, give uh, prominence uh, to the uh, principles of dialogue between civilization, cultures, uh, and religions. Uh, this is uh, uh, part of our commitment under the 10-year uh, uh, plan that has adopted uh, by the countries during the 18th session of uh, the Islamic uh, uh, Summit held in April 2016. May uh, God uh, guide you uh, through uh, the uh, path of success. Uh, thank you very much. The floor is given to Mr. Abdulaziz Othman al twaidri the Director General of ISESCO.
In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur Ilham Aliyev, Excellence, Monsieur Boubacar Kaïta, Président de la République du Mali, euh, Excellence, Madame Irina Bukova, Directrice Générale de l'UNESCO, Excellence, Madame l'épouse de Meux, Son Excellence, Monsieur Ilham Aliyev, Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai l'honneur d'être présent. Engagement and participation in it since the first forum, and uh, it is a great success that we can see now that this forum is becoming a world uh, event that brings from all the corners of the world. Et ainsi, ce forum est devenu un, euh, une grande. And I would like to thank His Excellency President Aliyev for all the efforts that he makes to bring people from all over the world to talk about peace, security, and development. Baku, as you can see, is the basin for dialogue, for peace, for development, for intercultural and religious uh, diversity. It contains all the elements that makes it really not only it's not an exaggeration it makes it really number one in a world full of troubles wars strifes hatred this country is living in peace in harmony and it is developing day after day i am a witness to that i have started coming to this beautiful country since 2005 and i can say that azerbaijan is a model of democracy, of development, of peace, of intercultural dialogue. So thank you, Mr. President, for all the efforts that you are doing to your people and to the world. And I also thank you for the support that you give to ISESCO and to the Islamic uh, intercultural and uh, joint Islamic work in all its field. Uh, I was going to read my speech, but time does not allow me. I know you are all tired because there are many other speakers who will come after me. But I will stress four points. First, the world needs peace, but peace cannot be attained or achieved if there is hatred and phobias and wars and injustice being practiced and disseminated all over the world. And I think the, the only reason for that is that the superpowers are not doing the, their job properly. They are fighting, struggling over their own interests and hindering the Security Council of the United Nations from doing its main job, and that's to maintain peace and security in the world. We have listened to His Excellency President's speech. The Nagorno-Karabakh is an, an example of that. 20 years of occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh and seven other districts of the integral, uh, of the integral uh, territories of the Republic of Azerbaijan with four resolutions from the United Nations and other resolutions from different forums and the problem is still existing. The Palestinian issue also, the suffering in Syria, the suffering in Myanmar, the wars that are erupting in many parts of the world, in Libya, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, everywhere you go, everywhere you look, there are wars, hatred, killings, destruction, not the destruction of the material infrastructures or the buildings or the cultural monuments, but the destruction of the human relations and the human fraternity. So the superpowers are responsible for the miseries of the world. And they have to stop fighting among themselves and make sure that the Security Council does its job properly. We have to voice this loudly. It is not time for soft words. It is time for action. Secondly, the armaments and weapon uh, the industry and trade has to be used. So they create war so that those weapons are experimented to see if they are effective or not. And if they stop this trend, 
and spend all those money that are spent on armaments, uh, uh, manufacturing a new destructive weapon, and direct it to health, education, development, peace, security, intercultural and interreligious dialogue, there will be uh, shortly a prominent peace all over the world. Thirdly, the rich who are becoming richer and the poor who are becoming poorer in this stupid uh, axiom that is not giving what those who need what they need and allowing those who have more to, to get more has to be stopped also. We have to have a fair distribution of wealth between the rich countries and the poor countries. And that will prevent the conflicts and the strives and the struggle that are going on in our world today. Justice is a, 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 a gift from all, Almighty God, but we are not responding to God. God called us to enter in peace all together. In the Quran, this is a verse. All you who believe, enter in peace all together and do not follow the steps of the devil. We are following the steps of the devil. And fourth and finally, Esesco is engaged in all the activities that are designed to promote understanding, dialogue, interaction, uh, and uh, coexistence among peoples all over the world. And I'm very proud to say that our partnership with UNESCO is an exemplary one. I thank you, Mr. Bokuva, for your support and for your engagement in this process. And I thank all our partners in the Council of Europe, in uh, UNICEF, in the WHO, in the World Bank, in the African Development Bank, in the Islamic Development Bank, all those partners who are committed to building a safe world, a world that can contain all of us, a world that can provide us with peace and security. ESUSCO will continue to work like that, and I thank you, Mr. President, and I assure you that we will be beside you all the time for the mission that you are doing. Thank you so much. The floor is given to Mrs. Gabriela Batani Dragoni, the Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Mr. President, Mrs. Alieva, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Council of Europe, I would like today to say very strongly that we are thankful to our member state, Azerbaijan, and its authorities overall for having undertaken this important task of organizing the forum of today. I would like to say that I had the privilege to be in this exceptional, and I measure my words, exceptional, dynamic and beautiful Baku in 2008. And it was at that time that the Council of Europe brought here the ministers of culture of all its 47 member states together with ministers of culture from neighboring countries. And it was already in 2008 that together from Europe and from outside Europe, ministers adopted a final declaration for the promotion of intercultural dialogue. Underlying already then in 2008, the power and the potential of culture for peace and sustainable development. 
I would like to pay tribute to you, Mr. President, and to your colleagues around you, but to you in particular, for the consistent support that you have given to this agenda. You referred to it before, the Baku process. It's a reality, it's not a dream anymore. It was a dream in 2008, but today it is a reality. And this Baku process, forums like this one of today, are giving us an excellent opportunity to come together and discuss such an important theme. It was also in 2008 that the Council of Europe published the white paper on intercultural dialogue, which was entitled Living Together as Equals in Dignity. Already then, the white paper drew attention to the challenge faced by European societies in managing their increasing cultural diversity. Challenges faced nowadays, by the way, not just in Europe, but around the world. In the white paper, we articulated our firm belief that respect for cultural diversity is an essential precondition for stability and solidarity. It is a belief which flows directly from the concept that we cherish and promote at the Council of Europe of democratic security, which says that peace within and between nations cannot and should not be secured by military means alone, but also essentially. It depends on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So important to us is this concept of democratic security that each year our Secretary General produces a report assessing the state of European countries' democracies. This report looks at what we call the five building blocks of democratic security. In other words, the five components of strong and stable states. And these components are, first and foremost, efficient and independent judiciary because honest and decent courts are needed to uphold the rule of law. The second is freedom of expression, so that all are free to express their different beliefs and identities, and so that the media is able to hold the powerful to account. A point that we emphasized this week as we celebrated the World Press Freedom Day. Next building block is freedom of assembly and association in order to support vibrant civil society. The fourth one is well-functioning institutions to make sure that democracy works in practice. And let's come to the fifth building block, which is especially relevant to our discussion today, inclusive societies, in which people from different backgrounds are able to live together successfully. I fully agree with the representative of the World Tourism Organization when he said that, indeed, living together nowadays is becoming increasingly challenging. We do live in fragmented times in Europe and around the world, fragmented by growing xenophobia, Islamophobia, 
aggressive nationalism and populism. Fragmented by terrorism and the climate of fear it creates, but also fragmented by mass migration involving many people that move around the planet to escape conflict and danger, and fragmented by poverty and economic hardship in many of our societies. And so against this backdrop of fragmentation, the question is how do we bridge divides within and between societies? How do we pull together fostering trust and mutual understanding between people, particularly when the forces of division loom so large? Because ultimately, we must do something about it. And this for the sake of our common security and for sustainable development too. The reality is that there are no quick fixes. All regions, nations and societies are different. But the Council of Europe is an organization which believes that any state wishing to manage cultural diversity successfully, certain conditions must be met. First, they must have in place the right laws to prevent discrimination. All states who are members of the Council of Europe and thus party to the European Convention on Human Rights must have robust anti-discrimination laws which are properly implemented in order to protect vulnerable groups such as members of ethnic and religious minorities, recently arrived migrants, asylum seekers, Roma people, and so on. These laws and their implementation are strictly monitored in the Council of Europe by our Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. And of course, and this is important, individuals, whoever they are, even if they are not European, but being resident in Europe, any individual who feel discriminated against by the authorities are able to bring their complaints to the European Court of Human Rights, which protects freedom of expression, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, along with all other liberties enshrined in the Convention. Next, states must guarantee social rights. We heard that. And we are very happy that we can hear the importance of social rights. So here I'm not thinking just of minorities, but the wider society. The policies of anger and xenophobia, which we are seeing in many places, are fueled, at least in part, by social and economic grievances where citizens feel that they and their families are deprived of quality education, decent health care, adequate housing and employment opportunities, it is infinitely easier for populist forces to stoke up prejudice. By contrast, where citizens can be more confident that their social rights will be guaranteed for themselves and their family and their children, they are less resentful. They have less need for someone to blame for their troubles. Third, well-managed cultural diversity requires education and respect for cultural rights. Here, intercultural dialogue enables a society to move forward together, reconciling different identities constructively and democratically. On the basis of what? On the basis of shared universal value. But this is only possible where individuals can come to the discussion with some understanding of their own identity 
and are able to communicate respectfully with those who see the world differently. At the Council of Europe, we therefore believe that teaching young people respect for other ways of life is a priority. This is why we have invested in a groundbreaking new initiative to develop competencies for democratic culture, which can be taught across Europe's schools. We also advocate teaching intercultural skills for intercultural dialogue from the early school years. And we actively support cultural exchanges at all ages. And during this forum, you will hear more about how we do this, including through the work of the North South Center, as well as on cultural roots. Last, last but not least, states must actively pursue policies of inclusion if they are serious about successfully managing their cultural diversity. Hence, the importance of policies of integration in order to build, as far as we are concerned in Europe, more inclusive societies. And I am very pleased to announce that one of the most prominent parts of this program for the next two years will be fighting Islamophobia. Uh, part of this activity will also be the network of intercultural cities who many of you know already and who are indeed developing very well their work of integration at local level. Anti-discrimination laws, social rights, education for intercultural skills, policies of inclusion and integration, these are, from our perspective, the vital means by which we counter fragmentation in our society. And they are objectives which are very much mirrored, by the way, in Agenda 2030, helping take us towards its vision of a safer and more sustainable world. One final thought after having listened to the previous presentations. Dear friends from ISESCO, from Alexo, from the OIC, UNESCO, of course, Mrs. Bokova, dear friends from different international, intergovernmental organizations represented here today, I remember something which I will never forget. When our white paper came out on intercultural dialogue in 2008, we asked our member states to translate it in their own languages. And with 47 member countries, many translations have been done, including, of course, in the language of this country. But then there was an important language which was missing. And it was only because there was an excellent cooperation between us that we succeeded to get through you who signed agreements of cooperation with the Council of Europe, or UISESCO, uh, but also Alexo, uh, and so on, we succeeded to have the translation of the white paper in Arabic. And the League of Arab States took it on its shoulder to distribute largely this book. I say this, dear participants, because that was a time which was not as difficult as it is nowadays, and we were able to do things which were very important and which were really leading us in the right direction. So I wanted to mention this example because we need not to forget that we can cooperate very well and very efficiently if we want so. And with this feeling of what we were able to do in the past, I am looking very much forward now to the results of this forum and to you, Mr. President, and to your first Vice President, Mrs. Alieva, please keep the flame of this Baku process strong because it's almost unique nowadays to have these opportunities. They shouldn't become rare. We need more of it. Thank you. The floor is given to Mr. Mario Lubetkin to deliver the address on behalf of Mr. Jose Graziano da Silva, the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations.
Mr. Ilyam Aliyev, President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Ibrahim Keita, President of Mali, UN High Representative, Directors, Generals, Secretary Generals of our partner in this very important forum. Permit me to start by conveying the greetings of Ma, His Excellency Dr. Jose Graciano da Silva, Director General of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, who could not be here today due to the prior commitment. I would also like to join all previous speakers in thanking our generous host, the government of, and the people of the Republic of Azerbaijan, in their vision, warm welcome and hospitality. Ladies and gentlemen, FAO attends the important event of the Alliance of the Civilization last year in, for the first time here in Baku. And we are very excited to be organizing a, full, organizing a fully plenary session this year in this fourth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. This is a true testimony to the urgent need to work together towards reducing cross-cultural tension and building bridges between communities in light of the commitment made in the 2030 Development Agenda to leave no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, at the conclusion of the event of the Alliance of Civilization last year, His Excellency, the United Nations High Representative of the Alliance, mentioned that food was an important element of our future and that food safety brings stability and mind of mind and peace. Furthermore, the FIO Director General highlighted the strong relation between food security and human security in his address to the UN security last year, and I quote, we know that actions to promote food security can help prevent a crisis, mitigate its impacts, and promote post-crisis recovery and healing. Where food security can be a force for stability, we have to look to food and agriculture as pathway to peace and security. It is therefore evident that there cannot be true food security without peace, and no lasting peace without food security. And for this, we need to support continuous and strengthen the dialogue among cultures and faiths. Food is an element that brings us together, and it helps us in our effort to build trust and understanding. A conversation of food can help spur a dialogue that allows us to understand what makes the other unique, to see what we have in common, and to realize how we can use diversity to strengthen our ties. The Baku process plays an important role within the framework of these novel goals. In that respect, it's my pleasure to announce that within the logic and framework of the Baku process, the United Nations Alliance of Civilization and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations are currently preparing a high-level event under the title of Interfaith and Intercultural Dialogue on Food Security and Peace. The event will be organized at the FIO headquarters in Rome this year with the participation of other partners. And it's also an expression of the privilege partnership of our two organizations are enjoying with our host that this event will be organized with the support of Azerbaijan. Ladies and gentlemen, FAO is working hand in hand with member nations, sister organizations and entities of the UN family the civil society, as well as the private sector, through many activities to address the immense challenges our planet is facing. We are convinced that it's only together that we can find adequate solutions for the global problem of today. In this respect, I would like to reconfirm the FIO is ready to continue playing an active role in the future endeavors of this important forum. In conclusion, allow me to applaud our host country, the Republic of Azerbaijan, for the ongoing effort of inviting leaders and representatives from across the globe to share experience, views, and dialogue here in Baku. Thank you very much.